man, I, just, I had this idea in my, it c- come into my head and my heart during worship, and, and, and we'll see if it, it comes out well. But um, the, the, the idea is, 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 you know, the way that you see reality, the way that you see life, the way that you understand life to work, and, and, and really, in a, in a big way, what you think about God, that's how you're going to be. You know, and 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 and, and, and I, th- I think of, of of you know, have you heard of Westboro Baptist? The people that they they go and they picket. Uh, uh, they have signs that say God hates sinners, and and they go picket. You know, um, funerals of of veterans, and and um, I mean, anywhere they can find. If, if there's something going on with LGBTQ plus, they go and have signs. You God God hates. You know. The, these, peop- these kinds of people are going to burn in hell. I mean, like, they're really vicious. And, like, well, of course they are. That's what they think God is like. And, and, and you know, whatever we think about life, about reality, about ourselves, about God and how God feels about us, that is going to be, whether we are as intentional about it as they are or not, that's going to be how... We reflect him. And isn't it interesting? I mean, it, it, when, I, when you see Christians who are really angry at sinners, mm, how sad. Because you know that's how they think God feels about them. I know, because I'm still recovering from that. What we think about God is going to be how we reflect Him, whether we're intentional about it or not. So I think today's message is really, really important. We're going to talk about God's patience. You can go ahead and throw our slideshow up. (laughs) That sounds gross. Throw our slideshow up. Sort of. (laughs) You've been waiting for God's patience for weeks? Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I've been putting this one off, um, testing your patience. Yeah, man, the patience of God is crazy, crazy. God made humanity and placed them in pleasure garden. He gave them a purpose to be the representatives of His own authority to all creation. He gave them love. They had love, purpose, and pleasure. But they wanted more. They wanted to be like God on their own terms, so they took God's fruit, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, and they ate it for themselves. See, God made humanity straight, simple, true, just love, just love and life, love and life. And so love and life. And now humanity has sought out many schemes for themselves. Trying to define for themselves what is good and evil. Each one of us has done that. And so all of us communally, that's what humanity is. A big glob of people trying to worship themselves. And as God looked at that disrespectful rejection and rebellion, as His very image blasphemed His name to the creation they were supposed to represent Him to, He did not just destroy humanity. But He moved to humanity. He called out to humanity as humanity was hiding themselves in the garden from Him. He beckoned humanity Guys, I mean, we're talking about God Almighty, and humanity rejected Him, (laughs) and God Almighty comes and says, would you please have me? Would you please step out of the bushes? Would you have me? It's crazy. (laughs) He made covenants with humanity. 
Even though they did not understand him properly, even though they did not represent him properly, even though they couldn't even maintain the imperfect laws that he gave them, and he only gave them some of those laws because of their hardness of heart. I mean, he was patient with them in every stage of this covenant-making process. He moved and moved and moved to humanity. He beckoned humanity ever nearer so that they might understand his true nature until in the fullness of time God became a human. Now listen, it is one thing to be God Almighty, just be, right? That, 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 that's a pretty big power to just be, to say let there be in their stuff, which is pretty cool because that means that we're all walking miracles. The air we're breathing, that's a miracle. It shouldn't be here. There's no such thing as the natural. Everything is supernatural. Everything is miraculous. The word natural is just a word we label on how the supernatural miracle of creation usually works. It's all mir- miraculous. But, 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 but it's one thing to be, to, to, to be powerful enough to say, let there be and there be, which is kind of how the Hebrew reads in uh, uh, Genesis 1. Where God says, let there be light. This is how I read it. I don't know if this is how a, 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 you know, a Jewish person would read it. But it says, it says, it says God said, yehi or, which is like, let there be light. Yehi or, let there be light. And the, the very next line it says, va yehi or. <laughs> God said, va, God said, yehi or, va yehi or. <laughs> what he says is, anyway, I thought it was funny. You don't have to think it's funny. But it's one thing to have that kind of power to just do that. Poof, there's stuff, right? But it's a whole other level to then have this creation that you made, that you're governing and, and, and loving, and, and then to become a part of it. That's insane. He became a part of his creation and manifested and showed what the nature of God is like. God is love. Oh, the patience of God. Thousands of years of patience calling a people to be a nation so that he might bless all nations bearing with them in their failure, disciplining them, redirecting them, until finally Christ came, died, and rose again, and, and, and the Holy Spirit was given, and now God's people are His own in a new and eternal way, and yet we still stumble and fall. I think of, the, 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 of Peter after Pentecost, after receiving the Holy Spirit, I mean, I mean, I mean P- 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 Peter saw Jesus dead. He saw him alive again. Peter had the Holy Spirit fall on him to an extent where he could preach in a, in a different language. Which I mean, I, every, you pray for the, the gift of tongues for me. I, 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 every day I'm like, I wish I could just know these languages. But, 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 but he, he just preached in a different language. Or, or, you know, what the Bible says, maybe it's more that he was preaching and other people were hearing it in their own heart language, which is still pretty nuts. He saw 3,000 people get saved that day on his sermon and baptized. And, and, and then, then, then he was sitting on a rooftop and he saw something like a sheet come out of heaven and all these animals on it. And the voice said, I'm taking eat. And he said two words that we should never say. No, Lord. <laughs> if you say no to him, he's not your Lord, right? But, 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 but no, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean, right? And this is what I have made clean, don't call unclean or whatever. And, and, and at that time... Somebody knocks on the door, and it's these Gentiles asking him to come and preach to Cornelius. And then and he goes and does that, and the Holy Spirit falls on the Gentiles. I mean, he, Peter is like seeing all this insane stuff God's doing through him. And, and then, then and one time he goes to Antioch, and, and some, some, some of his, 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 his Jewish friends show up, and, and, and he wants to show off in front of them, so he, stop, he stops eating with the Gentiles. He starts sh- showing favoritism, racism. And has to be reprimanded. I mean, Peter, the apostle, the bigot. See, 
even on this side of the cross, with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we can stumble and fumble and fail. But we have thousands of years of proof that God is patient with us. And how much more so now that we have the Spirit of God, that we are new creations, that we are one with the Spirit, that we are participating in the relational dance of the love and intimacy of the Trinity. Will God have patience with us? While, while uh, worshiping, you know, it, it hits me sometimes. Why in the world are you going to preach this message? Like, what good is it going to be whenever we're facing emergencies and, 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 and devastation in different areas of the world, different areas of our lives? Like, why, why are you going to preach a, a message of God's patient with you? Like, what is that really going to do? And, 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 you know, are we, are we just here to have a, a holy huddle where we come together and we, we put some salve on our souls and feel good about ourselves so we can go back out and just be happy and, 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 and ignore the problems of the world? And, 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 and I, I, you know, I think that what we believe about God is going to be how we represent Him. And if we can come to believe, to receive the freedom of God's patience with us, we can be patient with ourselves. And if we can learn to have God's patience with ourselves, I think there'll be a level of freedom and power to live the lives that we think we're supposed to live, that we're not going to get as long as we live under the supposed to live status of it all. And when our souls are free from that, we'll also be able to have that kind of patience with others. And maybe we'll even have the eyes to see pain in other people's lives that we couldn't see before because we were so drowning in our own shame and fear and doubt. So I, I, hope, that, I hope that we can hear about God's patience and, and apply it. And, 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 and guys, you know, I, I'm sorry that I'm your pastor. You know, I, I, I want to go to Scripture. I want to go deep into Scripture. I want to take the time to teach on Scripture. Because, because what I just said about God's patience, what made me feel good, it gave me hope. But if all I have is a, 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 a groundless, abstract concept for hope, then I got nothing kind of like what Paul said, if Christ is not resurrected, then we have no hope. If this Jesus thing isn't real, then, then, then we, we, you know, we might as well just, just live on the joy that we get from you know, Lord of the Rings or you know, Harry Potter and just, just start trusting in the power of Dumbledore to save us because uh, if it's just a myth, the, 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 I want to go into God's Word and see where is the concrete proof that God is actually patient, for, patient, patient with us. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. We're, we're jumping back into Romans. You can go ahead to our, our next slideshow. We're, 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 we're into Romans chapter 11 now. We've been going through Romans 9 through 11, and it's been, for me, a really fun journey to see what, what you know, in Romans 9 through 11, there's a singular question that Paul is ask, answering is with all that Romans 1, Romans 1 through 8 was the gospel, and, and Romans 9 through 11, he, he, he's like, listen, with everything that I've said so far, it sure sounds like the Jews are not in. How can this be if they're God's chosen people? Why are so many Jews not in? Has God rejected Israel? Has God's word failed Israel? And that is the singular question that Paul's been answering in Romans 9 through 11, and now we're in this last chapter of this section of Romans. And so far we've seen that not all who are born of Israel are truly Israel. And it's always been that way, Paul says. God is gracious to whom he's gracious and hardens who he hardens. And it's always been that way. We've worshipped worshiped him for it in the past. And it's not as if God is forcing his will upon humanity 
because it's actually clear that humanity always resists his will, but God is able to reshape vessels of wrath who are preparing themselves for destruction. He is able to reshape them into vessels of mercy that he prepared beforehand for glory. After all, Israel was already in the past once named not my people. And just as the Gentiles are now called children of God, so can wayward Israel be renamed my people once again. God's always worked with a righteous remnant to preserve his people and call all nations to salvation. And Israel has missed it because they pursued righteousness through the law by works instead of faith. But the word of faith is not far off. Anyone who confesses with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believes in their heart that God raised him from the dead will be saved. This is the word that's been preached to them. They heard it and understood it. From the suffering servant who suffers and rises for their sin to the promise that a different people will find God and instruct Israel, the word that God had given to Israel through the law and the prophets and the writings is actually being fulfilled in what Paul was writing, what the Jews and Gentiles were experiencing, and the massive Gentile inclusion to the salvation and people of God. So now we're in Romans chapter 11, and Paul's going to start wrapping up his argument. He's going to come back to a lot of the issues that we've talked about here, like the remnant, uh, the idea of hardening of hearts, the inclusion of the Gentiles, and, 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 and he's going to make the big point now that the inclusion of the Gentiles is actually for the inclusion of Israel. See, God has always chosen a people, set a people apart, so that those people can do what? Reflect him to others and bless others. Other, others and draw all others to himself. That's what being chosen by God means. Being chosen by God means you are a representative to the other peoples. And now there's only two types of people. There's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, black or white, red or yellow. There's God's people and those who need him. Those are the two kinds of people in the world now. Uh, so so um, 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 God is now in including so many Gentiles so that Israel will get jealous and be saved also. And they're all saved the same way because there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile. And so has God's word failed Israel? Has God rejected Israel? Let's see where we go now in Romans chapter 11 and see what it says to us about God's patience. Bueno. Bueno? All right, let's do it. Romans chapter 11, verse uno. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Now listen, throughout this discussion, I'm, I'm going to talk a lot about the idea of predestination. The, and, if, and if you're not a theological snob like I am, God bless you. I wish I had the faith that you have. Um, seriously. Um, but, but if you're like me, and you don't have the faith to not seek answers to all kinds of silly questions. Um, I'm going to discuss this some. The idea of predestination is that, is that salvation works like this. All people deserve punishment. God, in his grace, reaches in and saves some and not others. Um, um, and there are many, many, many people who believe that because they want... They believe in God's sovereignty and, 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 and His grace and, and the absolute depravity of humanity that we don't have the ability to choose God on our own. We need God to do this for us. And so there's, there's a lot of it. It's, it's, it's really peop, those who believe it, and, and maybe some of you guys here that believe it, and it's, it's, it's awesome. It's such a desire to try to understand God and honor His sovereignty and, and, and glory and grace. <coughs> um, I'm not there, Okay. And, and I'm going to talk about how this passage that we're in right now doesn't teach this. But I'm not trying to disprove this theological concept, even though I don't hold to it. 
Um, I don't, uh, it's a, to me, it's a mystery, just so you know, full disclosure. I don't know how God's salvation works. I know that it works. I know it's by grace through faith in Christ Jesus alone. But I don't know the inner workings and methodology of it. Who can know the mind of God? Um, to, to me, it's like the Trinity. I know the Trinity is true, and the Trinity makes sense of reality. I don't know how one God, three people actually works. I can't draw a diagram of it and write a systematic study of explaining it perfectly. It's just beyond me. So, so, so the whole only reason I'm, I'm going to go through and, and, and at different times and say, hey, look, there's a, this vocabulary in here is going to make us think that this is teaching predestination, but it's not. The only reason I'm doing that is, is, is simply because I think context matters. I don't, I, we need to, when, a lot of times we find in the Bible what we would bring to it. And I don't think there was a big debate in Paul's day about predestination or free will. It was more Jew or Gentile, works of the law or grace. And so Paul wasn't trying to spell out this, this idea of predestination or free will. He was, he was saying what? God's word has not failed Israel, whom he foreknew. And his chosen people now are going to reflect him. to the, So he's, he's using these words like elect and chosen and foreknew and predestined, but he's not using them the way that we have come to know them, and we bring those understandings to the text. And so what I want us to do is come to the con context of the, of the, the word and let it c come out to us. So that's the only reason I'm going to uh, uh, um, critique the idea that this is teaching predestination. Okay? Okay. So Paul comes up here and he says, has God rejected Israel and replaced them with Gentiles? And, and Paul says, hello, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, bro. Like, like Judah and Benjamin, those were the last two standing tribes of Israel. Remember Israel split up into north and south after Solomon and the northern ten tribes were conquered by Assyria in 722 B.C. And the, the bottom two tribes where Jerusalem was, Judah and Benjamin, I mean, those were the tribes now. I mean, they, you know for sure that that can be a pure line of Jewish uh, 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 heredity. Whereas these other ten tribes, man, they got all mixed up with Syria. Syria exported half of them and brought in, you know, Gentiles in there. And so you had this area called Samaria where you've got all these... They would probably think of them as like half-breeds, not really Jews, not really Gentiles, mixing it all in, and, 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 and just, just a bunch of pigs, unkosher swine. And, 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 and so, but, but, but man, Paul, he's, I'm from Benjamin. Like, I, I am the most Jewish of Jews you'll ever meet. I was a Pharisee. You know, and in and, 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 and other uh, books that he writes, he says, as far as being zealous for God, dude, I persecuted the church. Like, I, 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 I was all Jewish. God didn't reject me. <laughs> and, he, and he might go on and say, Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. His name was Yeshua. Just like Joshua. But, 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 but I mean, Jesus was a Jew. Peter, James, John, Matthew, Mark, like all the first Christians, Jews, because Jesus didn't start a new religion. <laughs> he came as the Jewish Messiah, drawing all nations to him. God has not rejected his people. <laughs> And so Paul picks up on some, some, some verbiage that he's already used earlier on in chapter 8. He says, those whom God foreknew. And in chapter 8, he, he said it this way, those whom he foreknew, and he's in, this, in this context in chapter 8, remember he's wrapping up talking about what it means to follow Christ, what it means to, to be a Christian, to have the Spirit of God in this weird world where all this groaning is going on for the redemption of of, of, of all things. And, and in that, talking about the church, he says, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Those he, who he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified. And so, so um, um, there, when the Bible says God foreknew something, that doesn't necessarily mean <laughs> that he foreordained it. 
Um, you can know what's going to happen in a TV show, and it doesn't mean that you foreordained it. That's just, I'm not saying the Bible doesn't teach that somewhere. I'm just saying it's not teaching that here. He foreknew his people Israel, and he has not rejected them. Um, so God foreknew, and those who were foreknown, as far as the church is concerned, were predestined to be conformed to Christ. Everyone that God foreknew to follow Christ was predestined to be conformed to Christ. Do you hear how that's not God, that's not teaching, whether it's true or not that God does this, this is not teaching that God goes in and saves some and leaves others. It's just not what it's teaching. Predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Who's that? Those who he foreknew. That's good news for us. No matter how, how, how hard we, we, we try or, or don't try, God is going to finish that work in us that he began in us on that day. Um, yeah, and of course, none come to God unless he calls them because none of us are good enough to think, hey, you know what? I need God. We need God to move to us, quicken our souls and our spirits to understand our need for him. So God calls all who are saved. And that doesn't necessarily mean he doesn't call everybody else too. So, um, yeah, uh, blah, 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 I'll qualify myself that I'm not anti-predestination. There we go. So let, let's, 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 let's keep going and see what, Paul, what else Paul is going to say, that, that God has not rejected his people. Verse 2b, or not 2b. Do you not know what the Scripture says of Elijah? How he appeals to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So you can find this story in 1 Kings 18 and 19. You know, essentially, um, King Ahab uh, uh, marries Jezebel, and Baal worship um, grows big time. And, and Elijah has this big showdown with the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. Have you, you ever heard this story? And he, he says, you guys, you guys set up your altar, I'll set up my altar. You pray, to your, you pray to Baal, I'll pray to Yahweh, and we'll see who sends down fire and consumes the altar. Right, and then it's a really funny story, and they're all doing their things, trying to get it to happen, and nothing's happening, and they're, they're cutting themselves, you know, and, and, and doing all that they can to make this fire come down from heaven and, and burn up the altar. And, and, and then Elijah, Elijah is pretty funny. He's sitting back there, and he's, he's going, maybe he can't hear you. Yell a little louder. And then at one time, he literally says, maybe he's relieving himself. Maybe, maybe he's on the potty. Give him some time. I mean, he's, he really heckles them. It's, 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 it's awesome, which is why we know that when we're competing in anything, that heckling is biblical. <laughs> and, and, unless, unless it's heckling at the, at the pastor when he's preaching. That is not... not oh, and, 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 but then Elijah says, Elijah says, you know what? Why don't you just come and, and, and dump like 100 gallons of water on my altar? And they just pour water all over the altar and all around the altar, and so it's just like like soaking wet. And Elijah prays and <laughs> lights up the 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 altar, and, and then he commands the people to go and kill all the priests of Baal. So this church camp that we worked at, they they were going to do the, they did this skit. Um, they did the skit, and they they had a a bonfire set up, and they ran a wire up from like a telephone pole or something like that so that whenever the whoever the actor was was Elijah would pray to God that they would send a flare down and light the fire and so they had all this wood and they were, they were supposed to soak the wood in, in diesel but somebody grabbed the wrong jug and soaked it in gasoline <laughs> and so just about blew up Elijah I think his leg caught on fire, and he had to run to the water, to the lake, and jump in. So that's just a fun story. Not applicable to the, the, the message at all. So, so Elijah runs away after that because after killing the, 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 the priest of, of Baal, Jezebel's mad and wants to kill him. So he runs away and hides in the wilderness, and he starts whining. He says, I'm the only one that's left that's faithful to you. And, and, and God says, no, I've, I've have set, kept 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee. 
to Baal. So what Paul's saying here is, guys, this is nothing new. Once again, there have been many times when we thought Israel was done, kaput, because nobody is following God the right way. But every time we think God, that, that, that God is done with Israel, we, we discover there's, there's a remnant. And, and Paul is saying, here we are, we're the remnant. We Jews who are following Messiah, we are the remnant. God is not through with Israel. And he's going to say in a little bit, and the Gentiles have been grafted into our tree. See, the Gentile, Christi- Christianity did not replace Judaism. Christianity is the continuation of true Yahweh worship. So God is not through with Israel any more than he's through with any nation. Let's keep going. Verse 5. So too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it's by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. It's so important to read stuff in context, man. You post this, you know, on your Facebook page or whatever, and you're like, boom, chosen by grace, man. God chose you. You didn't choose him. Predestination, sucker. But, but, what has Paul been talking about this whole time? Why are the Jews not in? Those who are not in, why are they not in? Because they pursued salvation through works of the law. They pursued it through the law as if it was by works and not by faith. So, of course, he's going to say this remnant is chosen by grace because they weren't chosen due to their, the point is they weren't chosen due to their faithfulness to the law. <laughs> it's not by works. <laughs> it's by faith. It's by grace. The remnant is chosen by grace. Let's keep going. Verse 7, what then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. (laughs) I don't know what you're thinking, man. Are you reading this, Nick? The elect obtained it, the rest were hardened. How in the world can you not read that and say, God elected and hardened? Like, how can you not just, it's, it's so clear. Read the words on the page, Nick. Well, the last time that Paul used the word elect was in chapter 9. He said that Jacob was chosen and Esau was not. And why? It says, so that God's purpose of election might continue. Now, what is God's purpose of election? Is God's purpose of election to uh, choose some and reject others? Actually, his purpose of, of election was to choose some to be a blessing to all. Isn't that why he chose Abraham? To make a great nation of him? That through him God would bless all nations? So God's election is not salvation. It is a label attached to his people who have been chosen to represent him to all. Here Paul is using the word to apply to the new remnant of Israel. The remnant of Israel was considered God's elected people and their goal now is to represent him to all the other people that they may, too may become the elect. Now the elect remnant are identified as those who have received Christ through faith, but the rest were hardened. But listen to what Paul's going to say about these rest later on, the rest who are hardened. Romans eleven twelve 12 says this, Now if their trespass means riches for the world, And if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? So these these who are hardened, Paul is saying it would be great if and when they come and are included. Almost sounds like this idea of hardened isn't a permanent prescription, diagnosis. In verse 23, 11, 23, he says this, And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. So all this election talk and hardening talk, (laughs) words don't have meaning outside of the context in which you use them. Right? Are you guys cool? It's kind of warm outside. Are you sure you're cool? 
Words don't have meaning outside of their context. That, that was an example. The word cool can have different meanings. Okay, okay. Yeah. All this election talk and hardening talk does not have the meaning to Paul what it might mean to some of us. Election is not about who is saved. It's about who is representing God as his people. And that representation is for the purpose of making God's name and blessing known to all others so that they will not continue in their unbelief, so that they might be grafted in to the tree of faith. And remember, we talked about the hardening of hearts earlier in, in this going through 9 through 11. We talked about Pharaoh's hardened heart, that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. But it, remember, it was strengthened and made heavy, hardened by itself by Pharaoh before it could be said it was hardened by God. And, and, and what it seems like it's God did with Pharaoh's heart is just what Paul said that God did with all humanity in Romans chapter 1, that God handed them over to their own evil desires. Romans 1, 18 through 32, especially verses 24, 26, and 28. And this is going to become even more clear that God is not, Paul is not talking about a hardening and an electing in terms of salvation, in terms of choosing some for salvation, electing them, and hardening others. It's going to come, re become really clear in the next few verses. Let's look at verse 8. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. Now that's a conflation of two Old Testament passages, one from Isaiah 29 and one from Deuteronomy 29. Um, and, and really the Deuteronomy 29 is just that last little phrase, down to this day. And it's a really beautiful uh, sign of how uh, uh, soaked in Old Testament Paul was and expected those um, who heard his message, expected them to be, or at least become, to, to know that when he said this phrase, he called to mind so much more than just the phrase, down to this day. Just like if I was, were to say to you, God is my shepherd. I've said a whole lot more than God is my shepherd. And you probably don't really think that I own a lot of sheep and God's out there taking care of them. Right? Anyway, let's look at the context here. What does Isaiah 29 actually say? Here's what Isaiah 29, verses 9 through 24 says. Astonish yourselves and be astonished. <laughs> blind yourselves and be blind. Be drunk, but not with wine. Stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord has poured out upon you a spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, the prophets, and has covered your heads, the seers, and the vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that's sealed when men give it to one who can read, saying, read this. And he says, I cannot, for it's sealed. Or when they give a book to someone who cannot read, saying, read this. And he says, I cannot read. And the Lord said, because this people, they draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And their fear of me is just a commandment taught by men. Therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. Ah, you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, who sees us? Who knows us? <laughs> you turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay? That the thing made should say of its maker, He did not make me. Or the thing formed of him who formed it, He has no understanding. Is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest? In that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book. And out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel, for the ruthless shall come to nothing, and the scoffer cease, and all who watch to do evil shall be cut off, who by a word make a man out to be an offender, and lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate. 
and with an empty plea turn aside him who is in the right. Therefore, thus says the Lord, who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall no more be ashamed, no more shall his face grow pale, for when he sees his children, the work of my hands in his midst, they will sanctify my name, they will sanctify the Holy One of Jacob, and they will stand in awe of the God of Israel, and those who go astray in spirit will come to understanding, and those who murmur will accept instruction." Man, this context that Paul's citing from here breathes hope for Israel to stop trusting in a commandment taught by men and to have their eyes open to look out of the darkness and see and honor the Holy One of Israel, to hear the words of the book and believe. <laughs> After all, it all started with them blinding themselves and making themselves drunk with their own standards. By their own standards, they seek to live. They look at God, the potter, and say, you didn't make me. (laughs) Guys, that that, 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 that is how so many humans have lived in this world. God, you didn't make me, and you don't have understanding. I understand this stuff better than you. That is a metaphor of humans trying to be their own authority and live by their own understanding, which is what Paul's been saying in the book of Romans all along. In this passage, Isaiah 29 is connect. I mean, uh, yeah, Isaiah 29 is, is connected to Jeremiah 18. If you remember, Jeremiah 18 was the big passage about potter and the clay that we talked about in, in Romans chapter 9. It's, it's, it's connected in, in, in the Targums. Uh, the Jewish Targums was kind of, they, they were ancient Aramaic translations but they're really more like paraphrases, um, kind of uh, how uh, the rabbis would, would kind of think about the text. A lot of times it followed the text straight, r- very closely, but sometimes it would stray off and become, you know, very paraphrastic. Is that a word? Very paraphrasy. And, and, uh, and in the Targums, it, it connected these two passages together, which is maybe why it was on Paul's mind, because it was already in Jeremiah 18, or a chapter earlier. Um, the thing is, the, the point is, is, is Paul is soaked in the Old Testament. <laughs> and so, so Paul may have in mind here a people who are blinding themselves, getting drunk on themselves, and so preparing themselves for destruction. But if they would but repent, God the potter could remake them for glory. Let's read just a bit out of Deuteronomy 29, the other passage that was cited here. It begins, uh, 29, cha- uh, chapter 29, verse 4 begins with this. But to this day... Thus, there's the entire citation that Paul uses in, in Romans 11. But there's so much to it. L- listen, listen to how it's connected. I mean, w- and you can know why Paul had this in his mind and why he wanted to bring it to the mind of the hearers of this text. But to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. It's almost like you've been hardened. I have led you 40, this is Moses talking, I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you and your sandals have not worn off your feet. You have not eaten bread and you have not drunk wine or strong drink that you may know that I am the Lord your God. And when you, come, when you came to this place, Sihon, the king of Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us in battle, but we defeated them. We took their land and gave it for an inheritance to the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of the Manassites. Therefore, keep the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all that you do. You are standing today, all of you, before the Lord your God, the heads of your tribes, your elders, your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and the sojourner who's in your camp, from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water, so that you may enter into the sworn covenant of the Lord your God, which the Lord your God is making with you today, that he may establish you today as his people, and that he may be your God as he promised you, and as he swore to your fathers Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, It is not with you alone that I'm making this sworn covenant, but with whoever is standing here with us today before the Lord your God and with whoever is not here with us today. This phrase, down to this day, is pretty important in our passage today in Romans. 
It calls to mind the moment when Moses reinstituted the covenant with Israel before they went in and took the promised land. He said, your heart couldn't understand, your eyes couldn't see to this day. But this day, step into the covenant with God. Take the land, the promised land. Hard and ununderstanding hearts, blind eyes, those are not permanent prescriptions from God. When God hardens, he, he hardens so that he can soften. He blinds that people may see. God can use them to draw people to himself. Hard and un understanding hearts and blind eyes. At any rate, Paul is, is laying out clear examples of hardened, blinded people being called into fellowship with God. And so far he's done that out of the Torah and Deuteronomy. He's done it out of the prophets and Isaiah. So where do you think he'll go next? The law, the prophets, and the... Who gets a sticker? The writings. The, the, exactly. So let's look at Romans uh, 11, 9 through 10, our last two verses of the morning. And David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. Well, that's mean. And it is. But that's not the end of the psalm. Let their own table be for them become a snare, and when they are at peace, let it become a trap with their eyes. Oh, this is Psalm 69, by the way. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see, let, and make their loins tremble continually. Pour out your indignation upon them, and let your burning anger overtake them. May their camp be a desolation. Let no one dwell in their tents, for they persecute him who you have struck down. And they recount the pain of those you have wounded. Add to them punishment upon punishment. May they have no acquittal from you. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. But I am afflicted and in pain. Let your salvation, O God, be set on high. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull, any kind of sacrifice or religious hoobly gobbly goop, um, um, with horns and hooves. When the humble see it, they will be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. For the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own people who are prisoners. In these passages, Paul has demonstrated that the law, the prophets, and the writings have spoken to Israel, warned them about hard hearts, blind eyes, and stopped up ears, and the holy writings also call them out of those states, promising salvation and relationship with God. So no, God has not rejected Israel. He's doing what he has always done from the day he called Adam and Eve out of the bushes to stop hiding from him to the day that you first knew that he was calling out to you. God has always been doing the same thing. He's been calling out to people. Softening hearts. Sometimes hardening hearts that they might become soft. Blinding eyes that they may truly see. He is beckoning. Paul is telling them, call, telling Israel, telling those who think that God may have failed Israel, God is beckoning those Israelites to stop hardening their hearts to him, to stop blinding themselves, to stop getting drunk on themselves, to receive his work in their lives by grace through faith. You can go ahead to our last slide there. You see how this message made me think of God's patience? <laughs> I, th I think Paul is saying, has God, I'm sorry, has God rejected Israel? Guys, the Torah prepared us for this. The prophets prepared us for this. The Psalms prepared us for this. This has been coming for a long time. God has patiently been laying the groundwork for our salvation. Think about the patience of God with Israel and with all humanity. 
He moves to us in such humility, stooping down to meet us right where we are, even with all the things we don't understand correctly or feel correctly or want correctly. In, in, in the midst of our rebellion, God stoops down to us and says very plainly, look, here's, here it is. Here's how I'm going to do it. Here's how I've done it. Here's what you do. Stop worshiping yourself. All these idols are trash. Have me. I've given myself to you. I've given myself for you. I have new life here for you. Oh, the patience of God with us. And he meets us right where we are and offers us himself. It's exactly what he did in Christ. He met us right where we were in our humanity, taking on sinful flesh. And he offered himself to us on the cross. And yet still, humanity has the ability to say, God, you're so mean. I've, I've, done, I've done that not too long ago. I've, I've told, told God that he's mean. Have you? Have you had stuff happen in your life? You're like, like God, wh wh why did you do this? Why did you not do this? thought you were good. Humanity has the ability to say, look, I bet God's rejecting Israel. And God, man, he's so patient with us. He says, listen, I told you about this through Moses, David, and Isaiah. Even in the midst of a culture that was so far away from my character, I still found a way to break through, met you where you were, called you to me by name, and prepared you and your ancestors for what was to come. For thousands and thousands of years, God has moved in such humility to humanity. So hear this. Wherever you are with God, His patience is enough for your weakness. You will not frustrate the patience of God. Especially those of us who are in Christ. He, he, his patience is enough for your lack of understanding. His patience is enough for your hurt. For your rejection of Him because of your hurt. whatever lie you've received in life, whatever, whatever it is you're trying to sort through in life, whatever hurt, hang-up, or habit, His patience is enough for you there. His cross is enough for your failures. Can you be still and know that He's God? Receive His infinite love as a gift and enjoy it. Becoming a, a Christian doesn't mean you sign on the dotted line to say, I'll try super hard for the rest of my life to be good. I promise I'll be better next time. I think the more we enjoy the freedom we have, See, I don't even want to finish the sentence. Because, you know, it's like the more we enjoy the freedom that we have, the more we'll stop those bad behaviors. But that makes it sound like stopping the bad behaviors is the point. But that's not the point. The point is the glory and the majesty, the great patience, the loving kindness, the grace of God. We glorify Him. He receives all the glory because we've got nothing to give Him but honor and worship because He, he, he is all in all. We are nothing but the receivers. God is not served by human hands as though he needed anything, but he himself gives, gives life and breath and, and all things. If anybody is going to serve God, he's got to serve God in the strength that God provides so that in all things God may be praised. When we do great things for God, we do jack. God does it. We're, we're, we're like we're like you know a, a little kid outside with the dad's mowing the, the lawn, and we've got the little little, little bitty toy lawnmower that blows bubbles. And we go out there and, 
and, and, and, and, and, and mow the lawn with, 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 with dad, and, 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 then, and then, you know, we get an allowance for it. That's what doing things for God is like. But it's even better because somehow he makes it where we actually do participate, and, and, it, and it does matter, and is more powerful than a, 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 a bubble lawnmower. And I don't know how, but it's just, he's, he, he's that big and amazing. It's, it's, it's a glorious thing. In church, man, well, with this knowledge, why do we get so wrapped up in the myths and, 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 and the fairy tales and the, 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 the arguments of this world? And when we join the world's battles and, and arguments and we, we fight and Facebook posts and, 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 and whatever else, and when, when we, we have this whole other reality to, to live out and call people into, we, 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 we take on the strangest uh, uh, missions and purposes. That, 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 that's not the message for today. But it's crazy, isn't it? So here's your invitation for today. Enjoy God. Just enjoy being set free today. Practice believing in your heart that He really has patience for you. And not patience like this. Get it together. I'm not going to smite thee, but I want to. Not that kind of patience. Like, he delights in you. Your existence brings glory to God. You are a reflection of him. He created you to reflect, to be a part of his image on earth. If you don't open your mouth and sing his praises, your existence emanates the glory of God. Because of him who made you in his image. His patience is perfect. Delight in his delight of you today. And I do think it's worth saying, as you enjoy that, let that enjoyment sink so deep into you that you are set free to share that patience with others. And I pray that we'll really do it that way. That we won't hear in this a message. He had patience with you, you better have patience with others. No, 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 no. Enjoy his patience with you so much. Let it become so real to you that it does seep out of you to others. Because that might be a good measuring tool. If you find yourself judging others, you may not have grown to believe the forgiveness, the patience, and the new life that is really yours. So you need to practice some enjoyment. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We worship you today for your ongoing faithful move to draw us ever out of ourselves and into you. Let that be accomplished a little bit more today. That we would be drawn a little bit more out of ourselves and a little bit more into you. And I pray that that would be manifested in our relationships with others, that we might love you and love others. So that you may be glorified in the hearts and lives of those for whom you died. We pray this for your glory and for our joy in Jesus' name. Amen.